Oh, I thought you were going to go alphabetical, Chris. So I was waiting for that. <laughs> no. um, all right. Sorry. You know what? I'm awake. To... I'm here. Um, <laughs> uh, good evening, uh, Rachel Sprecker. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, and I am the Executive Director of Partnerships and Development for Atlanta Public Schools. What does that mean? Um, it means overseeing um, all of the external relationships um, that might want to benefit our um, beautiful students. We serve 50,000 amazing students within the city of Atlanta proper, grades pre-K through 12. Um, and it's just a privilege to work with corporate partners, philanthropic partners, nonprofits, um, anyone that wants to plug in and engage with our students um, and universities like Georgia Tech. Thank you, Rachel. So you could choose who you want to pass the mic to next. Oh, man. Uh, I guess, ooh, Jay? Go for it. Yeah, who, 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 that was no surprise. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Chris. Uh, hey, family, Jay Bailey here, president and CEO of the H.J. Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we are endeavoring to build the largest center in the world uh, dedicated to growing, scaling, developing black businesses, uh, living at the nexus of access, opportunity and exposure and bringing the best resources from all over under one roof. Um, you know, Atlanta has to focus on 54% of its population participating in its economic growth and prosperity. Uh, we're here to try to equal those playing fields uh, and provide the level of access necessary for businesses to grow and thrive. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me today. I'm going to start by, um, so the, the topic, to talk a little bit about our topic and asking for each of you to um, maybe share some examples of how a university might engage uh, with your respective institutions and organizations. And uh, certainly I, I know uh, I could give a number of examples myself, but I think it's important, one, for our audience to understand um, the role that a university plays outside of its, its own campus borders um, and ways that we lend support um, to improve your organizations uh, and opportunities for the citizens of Atlanta. So with that, um, I'll turn back to Rachel. Yeah, so it's a great question and, you know, something I think about a lot. So um, the college I went to was a big state university in a college town and they called it a town gown relationship. And, um, you know, really, we didn't think too much about as, as a student. I didn't think too much about the um, surrounding um, environment. But um, as I've grown up and as I've taken a role in a school district, I've learned that um, a university is so interconnected to its K-12 public school system. Um, and so I really have to applaud universities like Georgia Tech for recognizing that a city is only as strong as its public school system. Um, a city is only, a university is only as strong as maybe um, the responsibility um, that they take in taking care of um, of the students that are maybe going to come to their university one day and then go on to get jobs and maybe be employed at the university or employed in the city. So um, I do think that um, it's amazing when a university does recognize that responsibility. And um, I have to just praise Georgia Tech for a couple different ways that we've partnered together um, the first is um, something that I think might be, I don't want to call it unprecedented, but I have not seen it elsewhere, but it's um, a program where each valedictorian and salutatorian um, of Atlanta Public Schools gets automatic free tuition admission into Georgia Tech. Um, you could imagine this is game changing for our student population, which is overwhelmingly um, 77 percent socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, predominantly black um, to get if you're the a valedictorian and salutatorian, you automatically get to go to Georgia Tech. I mean, that is game changing. That could change uh, generations that could, you know, change wealth or families. Um, so I applaud the previous president Peterson for. Um, I think it was his idea. He came to us and said, we really want, we want APS kids, homegrown kids to be able to go to Georgia Tech and not and get rid of those barriers, financial, historically, you know, cultural. Um, so that is just amazing. And then I could go through many, each of the, 
many disciplinaries at tech, aerospace, um, IT. Um, I made a little list, the Constellation Center for Equity. I mean, there's so many different disciplines that have now realized, you know, if we can expose the children of Atlanta to what's right here in our backyard, um, we could really transform um, our city and um, and give build a workforce uh, pipeline. So um, it's not lost on us what a asset Georgia Tech, its students, its staff, its faculty is in our own backyard. Um, but it's cool that they've realized that our students are an asset too. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And I appreciate that. Now, I think we have Leah fixed. Leah, can we hear you? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. All right, we're going back to Leah. So, Leah, tell everyone who you are. We're all like a year in, and I've never had technological issues before, but tonight, this is now my third one. But anyway, right, right. I kid you not. I, so, my name is Leah LaRue, and I actually wear two hats that I think are kind of relevant to the conversation here tonight. I am the assistant director for neighborhood planning at the city of Atlanta in the Department of City Planning. I work under uh, Commissioner Tim Keene, who many of you may know, and very pleased to lead the city's efforts to engage neighborhoods and get them connected to the city so that their voices are heard on the matters that are important to them in their neighborhoods. And I also serve in my own neighborhood. I live in Grove Park, right around the corner from Georgia Tech's campus. And I am the immediate past president of the Grove Park Neighborhood Association. I took a break this year because things were getting real busy in Grove Park. <laughs> indeed, indeed. As you may are. know, it's pretty hectic around here. So uh, I currently lead the, I, I serve as kind of a, assistant to the current president, Brandon Pierre Thomas. And I also lead our Grove Park Gives effort, which is a new subsidiary, a nonprofit subsidiary of the Grove Park Neighborhood Association that was formed to provide critical home repairs for seniors and legacy residents of Grove Park. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Very, very glad to be here. Glad that you can finally hear me and I appreciate the invitation. Great, thank you, thank you. So I'll give you a minute to catch your breath. I'll come back to you. I wanna to go to Jay to uh, talk some about how uh, Georgia Tech as an institution uh, can be supportive uh, with his efforts over at uh, Russell Center. Well, I love that you use the word institution, Chris. It's, <clears throat> you know, the pandemic is going to end. I'm hoping that a lot of the racial tensions that we've been feeling for the past year will quell a bit. Um, and communities are gonna need more than symbols of hope. They're gonna need institutions that manufacture it. I've always dreamed, Rachel, I'm glad that I've got both of you on the call and anybody from Georgia Tech listening. Literally, I think education means very little without aspiration. And you guys are at the epicenter of technology and engineering and shame on us if every student in APS doesn't spend significant time during their matriculation on somebody's college campus. Where else is Atlanta? I mean, literally, guys, taking an Atlanta commercial, where else can you go from Andre 3000 to Ambassador Andrew Young? We've got more corporations, corporate innovation centers, the whole AUC. I've been to Silicon Valley. I've been to Cambridge. Uh, the Research Triangle, love what they're doing in Nashville, love what they're doing in Austin. No other city is Atlanta. And for this pipeline, Rachel, that you talk about these brilliant kids, I'm a firm believer. The only difference between Bankhead and Buckhead is access, opportunity, and exposure. And if we look at those students that have brilliant ideas uh, and finding a pathway where they believe that their ideas matter, I think that's where Georgia Tech can play a significant role. You guys have some of the best thinking on the planet on your campus. You not only know where the technology is of today, but you're literally creating the technology of tomorrow as well. If we knew where the hockey puck was going, we can train the next Wayne Gretzky to score. So from business leaders, entrepreneurs, small business, and even down to students that are able to solve tomorrow's problems working with Georgia Tech, you know, I think that there's an opportunity in Atlanta to create economic mobility engines that really create revenue, drive revenue, create jobs, create hope, increase wealth in our communities. Um, and again, I always kind of push people, man, shame on us if we don't all come together and figure this thing out. 
and create something in this city that history will never forget. I think we are the city that has the opportunity to get diversity and inclusion right. Meld into there a sense of true belonging. And I think that the rest of the world is somewhat waiting on this town to figure it out. We're blessed to have Georgia Tech. I mean, think about it. Your dean of the engineering school looks like me. Your president, is his, his first name is Angel, and his last name is Cabrera. I mean, there is so much diversity and inclusion happening in the city. It is time for us to really fully realize it, because yes, Rachel, I love that it, this, the, the vowel and the sal of every APS school gets to go to Georgia Tech. I can't wait to the point where that kid with a 2.8 gets to walk on that campus and it gives him or her all the reason in the world to work that much harder because they can see where they want to be and they understand that they need a 3.8 to go to Georgia Tech. And it gives them, it connects that aspiration to that need for education. They excel and they take off. Then I pick them up, Chris, when they have a great idea and they want to bring it to fruition, where now they're in an environment of entrepreneurs that look like them. They start to believe that their ideas matter. And we give them the steps to go from ideation all the way to scale. That's an eco village, even better than an ecosystem where the, the small fish doesn't get eaten in an eco village. And I think that Georgia Tech has to play a significant role in that eco village uh, because for far too long, you guys have had a maybe a little gate around you on North Side, North, North Avenue. Time to take that gate down, man. Let's open it up and make it work. Yeah, amen. I would pass the collection plate <laughs> right about that. So uh, I want to pick up on and also give a shout to our, our Dean of Engineering, uh, Raheem Bear. And it's appropriate that we have Rachel on here because he is a product of APS. Uh, Shout out to Douglas yeah, I High School. Douglas High School. Yeah. Douglas High School. And I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to our dean of the College of Computing, Charles Isabel, who is a product of Mays High School. So Correct. Uh, Charles, if you're tuning in, I shouted you out as well. So, um, And so that is, Jay raised some really excellent points that I'm going to come back to in a minute. Um, but now I want to move to Leah and, and ask her to share both um, either examples or ideas for how university could partner and be helpful in her endeavors? Well, first of all, really difficult to follow Jay Bailey anytime, but <laughs> after those comments, my goodness, I feel so inspired. Huh. Um, and <laughs> I know he dropped I, that Wayne Gretzky line. I was like, oh my God. Right? <laughs> poetry. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I, I will point out that Grove Park Neighborhood Association has enjoyed a really strong partnership and a great relationship with Georgia Tech. And we certainly appreciate that. I think that in my work with neighborhoods like Grove Park and English Avenue, uh, Vine City, Pittsburgh, even in other disadvantaged neighborhoods in Atlanta, one thing that they have is big vision and big dreams. These people are not, these people, meaning my neighbors, are not without vision, not without dreams. We have that. What we tend to lack are the resources to carry these visions to fruition. And so our partnership with Georgia Tech certainly allows us to tap into some resources that we may not otherwise have. I know that Georgia Tech students have been so helpful to our neighborhood association here and even my neighbors next door in English Avenue with different programs. We, I actually participated in one such program just last year. We worked with the SLS program to do a rezoning project, uh, re-envisioning the zoning of Donald Lee Hollowell, which of course is a pretty major thoroughfare that runs through our neighborhood, and some connectivity issues that we wanted to address, some mobility issues that we wanted to address. Grove Park is a really interesting neighborhood, as many of you may know, but but what is probably one of the most troubling things for me in terms of access is that there, the southern part of our neighborhood is not at all connected to the northern part of our neighborhood. And if you live on or near Joseph E. Boone, you can't drive straight through to get to Hollowell. You've got to go all the way out to Westlake and then go up. And so the SLS students there were able to help us kind of figure out ways to make that happen and did so very well, by the way, and also talked about funding opportunities so that it's not just a project 
community members often talk about the city's plans. We often have plans that in, in the minds of the community sit on shelves or, or exist only on websites and ne we never do anything with them. So it was great to not only do the work on the plan, but also have some really solid ideas for how that work could be funded so that residents didn't feel like it was just another plan or that their vision you know, got worked out only to be put on paper and filed away, but it's actually something that we can do. So, and, and there are many, many other examples. I know Georgia Tech also did, when I was moving into the neighborhood a few years ago, they were at that time working on an oral history project, which is amazing. Uh, I can probably find a link to share with you all if you're interested. It turned out really, really well, though, and it's important in neighborhoods like mine and other neighborhoods around the city that are rapidly being gentrified. Many of them are losing that history, losing the, the voices of the people that, that laid the foundation for us and paved the way for the newcomers to be here. And so the oral history project definitely was helpful in recording their voices and hearing their stories and showing the newer generations and the, the newcomers what this neighborhood looked like and the different transitions that it went through as we get to 2021. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And so you all each kind of gave some different examples. So Jay talked a lot about kind of the, the aspirational aspect of what an institution like Georgia Tech brings. And I certainly um, echo his sentiments. Um, I often think about you know, some of the students that we host on campus, and, and Jay is exactly right. The only difference in Bankhead and Buckhead uh, is the things that he outlined, but also I'll say the expectation. And so what is your expectation of a kid um, from Buckhead versus what is your expectation of a kid from Bankhead? And a lot of times, of echoing Jay's sentiments, the expectations are different for that child. And kids will live up to that expectation, whatever it is. If it is very low, they will meet that expectation. And it is very high, they may they will meet that expectation. They often will rise um, if that expectation is put forth. So I appreciate those sentiments. Um, so again, Jay gave some, out, some, some background about where we fit in. Uh, Rachel certainly shared as an institution program uh, with the APS Scholars Program, which was the program she referenced for allowing the Valve and Sal's to, to uh, attend tech, um, which has been um, very helpful at increasing our uh, percentage of APS students. Uh, it's still not as high as we'd like it to be, but it is um, certainly there's, there's, there's been a great improvement and there's still work to do. And then uh, Leah shared some examples of how our students um, along being led by a faculty or a unit like Serve, Learn, Sustain, which is an outstanding uh, team, can really dig into a community to provide service. And so with that in mind, I, I think about, um, so, you know, Georgia Tech is a big place. It can be really intimidating um, for both students uh, in K-12, uh, but also for neighborhoods, and particularly when you don't know wh where your entry point is. And so um, there is no welcome center. You don't just walk on to this welcome center and there's a welcome mat and you get all your questions answered. Um, and so what would you say or what would you um, suggest uh, to our audience, uh, many of whom are uh, within the Institute, for how they might engage, do more outreach with your respective organizations? What advice would you give? For me, um, my advice would be you just got to find the right person to connect with. So, um, for example, you know, my role in APS is very much I'm a generalist. I know a little bit about everything. So my days go from a meeting about STEM in the morning, <laughs> maybe a meeting with Chris and the, you know, faculty <laughs> yeah, <no>. um, <laughs> talking about how we're like, um, you know, Darren, who's the director of um, IT at Georgia Tech, um, comes from Detroit and um, had a sports analytics program at his old university. He wanted to bring that to Atlanta. So, you know, I'll start the day with a meeting with Darren and Chris. Um, my next meeting's about arts integration with the Woodruff Arts Center, and how we're gonna get more of our kids to the High Museum. Um, my next meeting's about early childhood. Um, so, 
if you find your cause or your passion, um, something that resonates with you, um, and then you find that, um, that person within the entity, chances are we can navigate you to the right place and find that perfect match. Um, and then I got to echo Jay. I mean, Atlanta, this is my third school district. So I worked in a school district outside of DC in the suburbs in Maryland. I worked in a rural district in North Carolina, in Eastern like tobacco country in North Carolina. And then now I'm in Atlanta. There is no place like Atlanta. Like you can be in a room with, you know, Arthur Blank, and then you can be in a room with, you know, a legacy resident of Grove Park. I mean, it's pretty amazing here. So um, it is a small town. And um, so I, I think just zeroing in on your cause, um, doing a little bit of, you know, maybe connection, um, chances are someone's going to be able to introduce you to someone. Um, and then together we could we can make great impact. So so I take that. So uh, everyone interested in working with APS, email Rachel. Yes. <laughs> so, so there are weeks when Rachel and I see each other quite often in a span of a week um, in this same yeah. similar format. So thank yeah, you for it's that. It's incredible Rachel. the just the, the cultural capital in this town, the, the social capital, the corporate company. I mean, I am humbled. I've been doing this for six years, and I'm just humbled time and again when someone wants to help us out. And yeah, we can find a home for you, whether it's in APS or with one of our partner nonprofits. I mean. To me, a kid's a kid. So if you want to give your time to communities and schools, they're indirectly benefiting our kids. So fine with me. Um, or the YMCA, you know, those babies are going to be ours one day. So, um, yeah, we're kind of a, a, yeah, an ecosystem or eco village, like, like Jay said. So, um, yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't be shy. Yeah, I think you, you also bring up an important point too, Rachel, is that while you, you yourself work for APS, you're, you're certainly a bridge to a lot of other organizations that support the same constituency, which are the kids of, of, of Atlanta. And so whether it's the YMCA, whether it's, you mentioned communities and schools, uh, shout out to Frank Brown, uh, that there are many institutions that um, while we, Georgia Tech, may support APS, we could also support those other nonprofits that serve that same constituency, which are the kids of, of the public school system. So thank you. For yeah. All and one more thing before I pass the mic, I'm chatty. I get very passionate. Um, but um, they ought, you're the, the folks at Georgia Tech ought to connect with you too, Chris, because you have a knowledge of the landscape at Tech. I mean, I was approached by, or you introduced me to, a, I, I think he was an undergrad student who was working on like a nonprofit like he was oh, working yeah. on a <laughs> consultant project for a local nonprofit um, that wanted to, you know, he was helping them with a pro bono consulting project. And so I was one of his uh, interviewees. I mean, there's amazing things going on on the campus and probably easy ways for people to plug in that if maybe they, they called you up, they could be oh, connected thank you. to. <laughs> oh, people find me. They, 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 <laughs> they find me pretty regularly. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, Jay, I'll go to you. Sure. I mean, I think you have a great idea. Why not? Why isn't there like a Georgia Tech Welcome Center for families to be able to walk in, maybe do a we virtual have it on our wish list. tour? <laughs> we definitely so have it on money? our wish list. Go for it. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the, the tech and we're really pushing. So like shout out to John Avery over at ATDC or Donna Ennis at MBDA, where we're taking a lot of uh, the expertise and bringing it to the community, bringing it down, you know, Northside Drive a bit to the Russell Center. Um, we have a, a equal kind of relationship with ATDC. Every stakeholder company we support has a free membership to ATDC. Uh, it's it's again, man, how um, how you can make a big institution like Georgia Tech seem accessible. And beyond diversity and inclusion goals, the more important thing is belonging and having students having entrepreneurs, having aspirational minds and folks that are ideators feel like they have a voice on a campus like Georgia Tech. Uh, it helps that we have you in a position like you right now, Chris. It helps that Raheem is in his position um, to see their you know, value in their own reflection again. I think that, that Tech does a great job. So let me salute you for that. 
because based on what Lee is saying, based on what Rachel is saying, and based on what I've experienced, all of us have felt kind of the hands of Georgia Tech reach out uh, and partner. Um, but the challenge always, especially for an entrepreneur, if it's good, how does it become great? And, and what are the things that we can do to take what's good and make it even stronger? And this, the, even this panel is a testament to Georgia Tech's willingness to have an open ear to the community and community stakeholders about the possibilities of growth together. Um, because if we're going to solve any of the problems in our city, it's going to take the best thinking that we have from every institution that we have. And I love this panel to have Rachel, Leah, and then you, Chris, and myself uh, to talk about how do we move forward together. Um, so, so it's it's again, let's let's figure out more ways to share some of the magic that happens on that campus on North North Avenue. But I, I would be remiss without saying go dogs as a University of Georgia graduate on this Georgia Tech panel uh, and giving all of myself as a diehard Athens, Georgia Bulldog. Just Chris, I just wanted to mention that. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, we, we could accept that. We could accept that. <laughs> we certainly collaborate quite a bit with, uh, with that school in Athens. Um, maybe not on the sports field, but certainly in the research realm, um, we, look, we like to consider ourselves both, both economic drivers uh, and, and purveyors of excellent research. So Amen. Uh, with, Amen. The, with that, I will uh, move to you, Leah. Jay, I think they were scrambling to bleep it out, but they couldn't get to the bleep. <laughs> That's that delay that they told us about. It's probably bleeped. I just didn't even realize it. Right, it'll be bleeped on the replay for sure. Um, so, yeah, I would just say that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, I, I think that equity is always an important part of any discussion on what can we do to serve? Like uh, for, whether it's Georgia Tech or some random church on the corner, what can we do to serve? I'm always going to default back to equity because there are resources that some neighborhoods have that others just don't have. And I don't know if anyone in this city sees that more clearly than I do because of my work with the neighborhood planning units. I'm intimately familiar with all 25 of them from Buckhead to Bankhead, literally. Uh, I'm intimately familiar with the types of meetings that exist or that take place on, say, the north side of Atlanta and the east side of Atlanta versus those that take place in northwest neighborhoods like mine or in the southwest. They happen at a very different level. And so equity is always important. But when 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 you're talking or when you're thinking about how to plug in kind of into the community, the gateway for the community is going to be the neighborhood association or the MPU. And to Rachel's point, I always say that if if we're all separated by six degrees in Atlanta, it's got to be more like two or three degrees. You always know someone who knows the person you're trying to get to. Yeah. Or maybe you know someone who knows someone. But I can almost guarantee you that if you show up at a neighborhood association meeting, you're almost guaranteed to meet someone who knows that person you're trying to get to. Not to mention, you then get a good pulse of what's going on. You get to hear the issues related to APS, the issues that parents have and that students have. You get to hear the visions of the aspiring entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurs that tried it and didn't work out, so they went back to a day job, but the dreams are still playing in their heads. You really get to connect to everyone and you get to see what the needs are for the community. One thing that I talk about a lot is that uh, cities often, and, and other organizations as well, often plan for neighborhoods and plan for communities as opposed to planning with them. We often, those of us that are passionate about what we do, we know what this neighborhood needs. And we show up in this neighborhood and say, this is what you need, here you go, as opposed to coming to the neighborhood association meetings or the NPU meetings and hearing those folks who live there articulate what they actually need, not what you believe they need, but what they actually need. And so I would just encourage students, faculty alike to to kind of dig in at the neighborhood level and dig in at the MPU level, even school board meetings. I mean, 
there are always community meetings to attend that will really get you plugged into the neighborhood and give you a level of context that you just won't get in the classroom and you you really wouldn't get any place else. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point, Leah. And I, I'm just wanna, you know, kind of pick up on that. You know, I think one, um, I also uh, have taught um, for eight, nearly eight, eight years now at Tech. Um, and one of the, and the class, these are kind of project-based learning type of courses um, in the honors program. And the, the focus of the classes I have are all external. They're all focused on some element of the city or in a um, public school best academy. And so what I find most interesting is um, when going, getting into kind of uh, some of the demographics of the city, beyond what you would read in a, in a, in a headline, um, students know very little, even the students that are from here actually know very little about the city. I think Atlanta for, forever, and part of what uh, Jay mentioned in his opening comments about what makes Atlanta different from Silicon Valley and from Austin, Texas, and from these other areas is really Atlanta's rich uh, history and civil rights and the culture uh, and the, you know, the music industry, the film industry, and really being a, a hub for black entrepreneurship, which you don't definitely don't get in Silicon Valley or Austin or any of those other places for that matter, uh, has a rich uh, history with uh, HBCUs and having this big contingency of those here. And so that kind of sets Atlanta separate from those cities um, that, that Jay referenced in his opening remarks. And what I um, certainly encourage you know, our viewers tonight um, whether they are students, staff, or faculty to do is really uh, get out of Georgia Tech's bubble and really into the city and really learn uh, the communities, not just at that level of uh, participating on some board, um, but also some of the things that Leah mentioned, you know, show up to an NPU meeting or just show up to a, a APS board meeting or just show up to a neighborhood meeting, whether that be you know, English Avenue Neighborhood Association, they meet on Saturdays, you know, show up and you really get a sense on really what's happening on the ground in the city that is certainly very rich, uh, whether it's uh, economically rich or not, it is certainly very rich dialogue that takes place in most of those meetings and it certainly will connect you uh, and give some clarity to how whatever your role is inside tech can actually work um, to improve the quality of life, uh, wherever that is. And so I, I, I thank you for that. And so, you know, I want to jump to a, a question we'll, as we continue our conversation. And so the question is, I have to move some icons around here. So um, Georgia Tech uh, is often thought of um, as really this place for engineering, right? And then that makes sense. It's, it's large engineering school, largest in the country. Um, but a lot of times it's overlooked that we have an excellent liberal arts college in the Ivan Allen College. And so the question is, how do you envision the liberal arts engaging and partnering with communities in Atlanta? Uh, Leah referenced the oral history project, but what are other contributions the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts can contribute? Oh man, I mean, I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's good. I was going to say, think in terms of things that have nothing to necessarily do with STEM. I was going to say, I think, you know, that's a bias I have even um, that I need yeah. to correct is that I think the narrative, there is a narrative, you know, this is a premier um, STEM university. And so, you know, literally anytime one of my colleagues or pr school principal or anyone comes to me about some kind of STEM partnership, I immediately am like, oh, we have partnerships at Georgia Tech. Um, but yeah, what an untapped resource and what a, yeah, a prejudice on my part to not really remember um, the amazing liberal arts college. And I would just say to the Ivan Allen Liberal Arts College, you know, we want you. <laughs> we want you in the APS. We want you to uh, thought partner with us um, for our students that are creatives, um, our English language arts programs, our theater, fine arts programs. I mean, all of the disciplines. Um, we need you. We have a literacy crisis here in Atlanta. Um, it's no secret. I think that, you know, 60% of our uh, students in the APS um, do not uh, read proficient or above. 
um, which many people know is an indicator for dropout. Um, it's, you know, very widely published that they build prisons based on um, third grade reading scores. So that's, you might hear the term school to prison pipeline. I mean, it's a literacy crisis. Um, our teachers do the best they can, but like we were talking about, our students live in poverty. I mean, they live in deplorable conditions. You would not even want your dog to be in sometimes, but just because of that doesn't mean they can't can't thrive. There's just some factors outside of school that prevent them from learning and being ready by kindergarten um, to, to go on and do great things. So any kind of intervention um, that you can think of and provide to help with literacy and writing, um, creative writing, um, we will take. So that's just for instance, um, but yeah, kind of like Jay said, shame on me, shame on us for <laughs> maybe not realizing that that incredible asset and all the majors that are available. No, no, it, it's a common. It's there, that's certainly a common thing. It's you're you certainly aren't the only one. It's very common. I think that um, you know, just in a quick Google search of the the, the majors that are offered there. I love Atlanta, love Atlanta dearly, but I love her enough to be honest with her. We've got some real economic, socioeconomic issues. I mean, we're the worst city in the country for income inequality, uh, worst city in the country for economic mobility. Uh, child born into poverty has less than a 4% chance of reaching the upper middle class. Like these are things that we can fix. And so when you have like an economic school, uh, socio sociology, uh, communications and media, um, there's some deep data into understanding why we continue in this cycle uh, there's an opportunity to tell a different story and a different narrative. Um, there are ways that the, the liberal arts college can get involved in the deep unpacking of how we become a better city. And then after we become a better city, how we tell the story of how we got there. I love what Leah said, and I even wrote it down about the oral history over at Grove Park. Um, you know, liberal arts colleges, especially at an organization or institution like Georgia Tech, we need you. I mean, you've got some of the biggest brains in the nation in this liberal arts college that can help us unpack how we get to the solutions, how we get to the root cause, how do we start building some platforms that can get us out of the root cause, uh, but then again, how we tell the story so that no one will ever forget it. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree, Rachel, that it is time for us to shed a bit of the engineering, not saying computer science and engineering. You guys are always be known for that. But I think there's an elevation of Georgia Tech being in the heart of the city. You even have your own story to tell about Georgia Tech through the years that I think would be very valuable. Um, so, no, I mean, especially from, you know, economics and communications, let's have a call. If any of you guys are on the on the on the uh, panel watching right now, because we could use you. We could use those those soldiers in the street figuring this thing out, because I don't think it's a a, a city government issue to figure out. I think to Leah's point, although she lives a dual life in city government and a community hero, the community is going to have to start looking at how do we solve our own problems. And Georgia Tech being one of those community stakeholders can be a part of the solution. Yeah, thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. You raised one, you know, something I'm kind of tying to, uh, tying to uh, what Leah mentioned was that storytelling. And certainly, one thing that really resonates with people is storytelling. That's so, so and, and that uh, is a very good way at um, pushing for change and communicating because you know telling a good story and you know, everyone's not going to necessarily sit down and comb through data, but certainly having a really good story, a well-told story, um, could share the, the narrative about where you've been, but also where you're trying to go. And I think that's really important. Uh, so, Leah, uh, I'll give you the last word on this and then we'll move on. Yeah, ab absolutely. These neighborhoods are full of rich history. None of these neighborhoods were, you know, created in the last couple of years. They are full of history. And we all know that we we can learn from our forefathers, from the folks that came before us and established the neighborhood. Uh, I actually learned just this morning we were I was talking to another neighbor about white flight and how this neighborhood was created by uh, uh, Dr. Grove, who named the neighborhood after himself and uh, named us many of the streets after his daughters and nieces and other young girls in his life, et cetera. 
and uh, or young girls in his family, I mean, et cetera. And a gentleman said to me, a neighbor, well, you know that uh, even after white flight, there's one holdout. There was one white lady that refused to leave and she actually lived right behind me until the day she died a few years ago. That was new information for me. I just learned that today. But what I was able to contribute to that discussion that he didn't know was that I also learned another section of our neighborhood, the Urban Villas Pine Acres uh, subdivision was built in the 60s, late 50s and early 60s, because those homeowners weren't allowed to purchase in Grove Park proper. So they built their own little subdivision, which is now a part of the Grove Park boundaries, but back then it wasn't considered that. These are stories that the folks who live in these houses in Grove Park, particularly those that have moved here in the past five or 10 years, they need to know this. Future generations need to know about how this neighborhood was built. And that applies to all the neighborhoods in the city. They all have so much history and so much to learn from. If we're talking about um, liberal arts and how they can help, obviously I'm talking now about history, uh, the history of a neighborhood, and I don't wanna kind of beat that over the head, but there are many other opportunities that to engage the communities. In fact, community engagement is one area that I think every neighborhood has in common as something that they're lacking. That is the one thing that none of the neighborhoods do exceptionally well. Uh, some do much better than others, but most of us have a really long way to go. We do some really robust engagement here in Grove Park, but I always remind people that at the end of the day, there's a neighborhood of 3,800 people and on a good day, we may have 125 in our neighborhood association meeting. It sounds good. It, when you're in the room with 100 other people, mm -hmm. it feels good to have that many neighbors engaged, but you still have 3,700 that are disengaged. You still have 3,700 that don't even know that the neighborhood association exists. That is definitely an opportunity for partnership and for liberal arts students to kind of make a dent and leave a thumbprint behind. Uh, with community engagement for sure. And then of course, over here, we've got this little project that you may have heard about. <laughs> <laughs> we've got the West Side Park and yeah. uh, Microsoft's recent purchase of the Quarry Yards site. That is catalytic development that is going to require an unprecedented level of community engagement that needs to expand far beyond just Grove Park into multiple neighborhoods. That's just one other opportunity. There are tons of opportunities for Georgia Tech students to get involved, the students of the liberal arts colleges, college rather, to get involved in the neighborhood and really make an impact. Yeah, thank you, Leah. And, you know, it's interesting because you, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the Microsoft project. And then you, you so you, you have this, you know, coming in, which is certainly going to be transformative for the neighborhood. Um, and then you couple that on kind of at the other end, just outside of the neighborhood, uh, Georgia Tech has a very large project, um, which technically is an English that. Avenue. Yeah, yeah. that's, gonna, that's yeah. going to potentially bring upward of 5,000 jobs, and you tack on the 1,800 or so jobs that Microsoft proclaims that they will bring in. Um, there's gonna, the neighborhood certainly um, will transform in the next, uh, well, our project is a 10-year project, but Microsoft's is a shorter window, so that's going to present a lot of opportunities for engagement. Okay, moving on with questions. As we, uh, so, how do you see the Georgia Tech student body changing in the next few decades? At this point, the school is nowhere near as diverse as the city of Atlanta and has quite a small uh, black indigenous, uh, black indigenous people of color population. Do you see a future where students of color feel welcome and at home at Georgia Tech's campus? So I guess that I'll take that one. <laughs> um, so I would say, yes, yeah, so Georgia Tech is, is embarked on a new institute plan. And in that strategic plan, um, it's available online. If you Google strategic plan, GA Tech, you'll, you'll get to it. Within that strategic plan, one of the six focus areas is expand access. Um, expand access is uh, just how it sounds. It is both to expand access for uh, bringing in more students, 
but it's also physical access. And so certainly when you enter Georgia Tech, if you're coming from Midtown, um, you kind of seamlessly end up in the middle of a college campus, certainly if you come across um, Fifth Street. It looks a lot different if you're coming from the west side, right? So if you're coming from uh, the communities that we're discussing, certainly if you're coming from off of uh, Donnelly Hollowell, uh, the access point to get into campus is like a maze. Uh, there is no easy, seamless transition point, um, and that 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 is certainly not by accident. And so, you know, moving forward, as tech uh, builds out west, and and campus will continue to expand west. Uh, the the project that I just referenced is at the corner of Northside Drive and North Avenue, uh, and and there will be other developments. Um, the campus will be reconfigured so that it is uh, welcome and does have a a welcoming access point from all sides of town, not just from the Midtown North uh, area of campus. And when you do that, I think it also communicates a message of who is welcome in this space. So, so certainly um, I see that as being impactful. And then the other thing I would add to that is um, under that expand access, there's increasing number of programs that we're trying to do um, in the Atlanta public schools. It's in part why I see Rachel so much. And so uh, there's a lot of opportunities there, um, not just with students. Um, so we just had a math uh, project-based learning uh, program that we did with teachers uh, yesterday, I think. And so that's where we have faculty um, in engineering um, and, and math and science work with uh, K-12 educators on incorporating different models for, for delivering that content. And so that's also useful. And so as you you continue to build out these program offerings in the public school system and make more programming more accessible for people, regardless of income level, I think you will continue to see kind of that shift of the student body um, at tech. And uh, I think that that is where we're looking at. That's certainly what our, our strategic plan is focused on and what you'll start to see uh, as we embark um, on our next uh, capital campaign and things to move forward is to really make that come to fruition with more targeted uh, fundraising in that space where we can ensure that those students, like the program uh, Rachel mentioned opening, uh, the APS Scholars Program, where we can ensure that there is uh, certainly not a financial impediment for students um, to attend Georgia Tech. And so that's, a, that's one way I definitely see that changing. All right, we have uh, like one minute. <laughs> so if I last minute before we have to, have to Kind of go back to uh, to Alex, our host. So uh, be before and before I do that, I certainly um, want to give a shout out to Scheller for continuing to host such lively uh, dialogue through their impact series, uh, and specifically to the Institute for Leadership and Social Impact. Um, they do an excellent job at really trying to incorporate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of their programming. Uh, and it just kind of, it, it's it's woven into the ethos of what that office does. Um, and so I wanted to give a shout out to them, very grateful for their work. And so in our last few minutes, you know, I wanted to give uh, each of our, our panelists an opportunity to give some closing remarks and what their hope, uh, just generally speaking, for the city, let's say, uh, since we're, we're kind of, well, we're not coming, we're coming out of a pandemic, we're still in it. But what is their hope for the next 12 months for the city and their respective uh, organizations? And so with that, I'll give it to whoever wants to say, Jay, you can't go first because nobody wants to go behind you. So I'll go back to Leah. <laughs> I'll go back to Leah for that closing, her closing comment. What is the question again, Chris? So the question what is, is, what is your hope? What do you hope to see um, both in your organization and the city for the next 12 months as we continue to come out of this pandemic? Well, for one, I'm hoping that employers will realize that most of us can do our jobs from home. <laughs> Although I very, I very much actually miss City Hall and I, I eagerly look forward to getting back to work. I think that um, we are, we're currently in a place where we are approaching our last opportunity to ensure equity in Atlanta in our lifetime. That's not to say that, you know, 50 years down the line, our 
our descend our our uh, children and grandchildren won't be having a similar conversation. But for our lifetime, this is really it. The it, things are housing, for example, is becoming more uh, expensive and less affordable and people are being pushed out of the city left and right. The city is working really hard to slow that down and to create more affordable housing. We all know about the mayor's uh, housing affordability initiatives, and certainly my department, the Department of City Planning, is working very hard to advance those initiatives. But we really have a way to go, and I think that it's something that all of us as students, as residents, as organizational representatives, we have the responsibility to do our part. Whatever that one part is, it's our responsibility to do it. So I'd say that over the next 12 months, we absolutely need to be figuring out in out of every project that we see, out of every opportunity that we see, how can we make it more equitable? What can I do to make this an equitable or to advance equity in this project. I think that needs to be the focus hands down in everything. Thank you, Rachel. I'm in a plus one, double click, all those like sexy <laughs> business terms on yeah. that. Um, equity, equity, equity. So, you know, I'm really proud of Atlanta Public Schools for hiring the first ever chief equity and social justice officer. We have the Center for Equity and Social Justice that's launching. That means that, you know, every department, every school is going to be viewed through an equity lens. So that's everything from inclusive policies to equitable funding. Um, so that gives me a lot of hope. But, you know, Jay said it at the beginning. I mean, you don't the the title that Atlanta has most unequal city in America for three years running. That's a title no one wants. Um, but if there is a city that can do this, um, it is Atlanta with all of the wealth that's here, with all of the, you know, amazing things coming. Microsoft, we mentioned the Propel Center. I mean, we just have to make sure that, like, our kids at APS get those jobs. Like, don't fly people in from California. Like, we want those those high wage jobs for our kids. So, um, you know, equity through housing, through transportation. I mean, we've We've said long before the pandemic, ed educators have been saying for so long, you know, schools are really like the heartbeat of the community. Um, we're more than just academics. We provide food. I mean, this year we became telecommunications providers, for, you know, and tried to close the digital divide. And, you know, I worked with Comcast to try to get modems installed in our kids' houses where they can't afford internet. Um, and we had to raise external money for that. So, um, you know, anything that <laughs> I'm not going to blame or point fingers at whose responsibility telecommunication should be. But, you know, those are the things that, you know, if we just all take a step back, learn these lessons that we did from this year um, and put the resources in the hands of the people that need them um, and that the people that have them aren't afraid to give them up. It's not a zero sum proposition. Um, we could we could really move this city forward. Thank you. And real quickly, Jay, before we turn into pumpkins here on screen. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it, it, mine is simple. It's about love. I mean, if we really realize how much we, we need each other, I think we become a different city. Uh, if big corporations understand their role in community, if colleges understand their role for the next generation, if I can look at Rachel and Leah and see my own reflection in a white woman and a black woman, Latino woman, um, Again, if the pandemic has made us miss each other because we've not been able to be in the same room, I'm hoping that it's given us an opportunity to realize how much we need each other. Uh, the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think Atlanta has the possibility to go really, really far. But we're going to have to make sure that we live by the creed of the city too busy to hate. I don't know if we've ever really delivered on that promise fully. Yeah. yeah um, but. When they talk about the Atlanta way, I think it's it's time for us to also realize that prop, that platform as well, uh, to have all these beautiful assets that both Rachel and Leah talked about, that you talked about, Chris. Uh, how do we come together uh, and make Atlanta everything that everybody dreams it to be? 